it is hard to get. Yes, I want to be on the Or you? I think I Okay, um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is the first of a series of events which are going to happen very quickly today, tomorrow, to next week. Um, and, and they're kind of conversations with Wang Wei, uh, who is uh, a visiting scholar for a couple of weeks now. and. He will start working at Goldsmiths uh, next year uh, at, as a point five professor and um, from Tsinghua University. But I think I was trying to think of a title for the series. Um, and I think something like, I, I can kind of, Iri Rogoff is going to be the discussion, the discussion and today is going to be Bernard Stiegler and Long Wei are, are going to talk. Uh, and Iri Rogoff is going to be the discussion. And I, and I thought of a very kind of Rogoff type. <laughs> She's going to be the discussant of my dreams. <laughs> my fantasy discussant. Um, but you can say anything you'd like. You don't have to address it. But what I, what I thought was, you know, what 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 is a good a good a good um, a good title for the whole series? And I was thinking something along the lines of China and this and that. But I think that's probably wrong. It shouldn't be China. It's something. It's something like the the, the, the geopolitical to come. Or the coming geopolitical, yeah. What kind of what kind of geopolitical is the geopolitical to come? You know, and this is this is a kind of a not Jean-Luc Nancy or a Gambin or or a Kantian third critique type title, but it's also a title that that um, opens up the question of modernity, yeah, of modernity. And what kind of modernity? What kind of modernity? Um, it opens up the question of you know of of, of China as in to such a large extent driving. This coming geopolitical, this geopolitical to come. It opens up also questions about Europe. It opens up questions about about theory. Um, and today's today we asked um, Wang Wei and Bernard, and I forwarded this to you. Read. I'm so kind, so so pleased that she has agreed at least to say a few words. Hopefully, um, Rogoff. That um, today's one we, we're we're going to focus on modernity today, but also on Europe, perhaps if we have a moment in the context of. Uh, in this context. Um, and it's sort of interesting that I think last night we had dinner with Joyce, where's Joyce? Um, Joyce Liu, who's visiting from, from Taiwan, had a wonderful, wonderful lecture yesterday. Um, and, 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 and Joyce was talking about that, you know, that Bernard would probably talk about techniques or something like that. Of course, Bernard <laughs> talks about a lot more than techniques, but I'm always talking about techniques, but so is Bernard in his own way, always in different ways. And so Wang Wei thought that he would also think of, he might think about science. Um, so we have, we've got art, we've got science, we've got techniques. Uh, and so people should just, just ship in whatever they want, whatever they want. And let me just say that this is live streamed. This event is live streamed. So if you're going to, you know, if you're going to say something that you otherwise wouldn't say, <laughs> don't say it. Or maybe don't walk in front of the camera. Where's the camera? Oh, there's the camera. Hi, Ellen. Is that Ellen? Hi, Ellen. Uh, so, yeah, I better watch my step. Um, and uh, so the, the format is that first Wang Wei will talk for maybe 30 to 35 minutes. Um, and, and then probably we, we should either probably go straight to Werner. He'll talk for maybe 40 to 45 minutes, a bit longer. Or, or you know, as you like. You want to keep it a little bit shorter or whatever. Um, and then maybe some discussion, and when Erie feels like chipping in, chip in. And I'll try to be quiet as much as possible. Of course, Michael Dutton is here to say, who is a, uh, uh, well, he is Michael Dutton. <laughs> so why don't we start? <laughs> um, so, 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 so something typically aggressive will come from Michael, and, and wonderful, of course. And so if nobody else is kind of getting sparks flying, he will. So let's start with, which is, I think, a wonderful televisual kind. Gesture. Let's start with with Wang Wei, uh, who's going to ad ad address the idea of science. Okay. But but bend it any way you want. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. I see. Uh, maybe. 
Do you have PowerPoint set up? I think that they, they PowerPoint it already. Is there a PowerPoint PPT set up? Where is the highlight? Ellen. Yeah. It's PowerPoint here. discussed how to make this conversation. And um, 
because I know that the Professor Stephen is working on that he is early work, a famous work on the techniques and the time. So, but uh, my, I think that the, all, I choose this topic only because you are the, uh, the real scholar in, in these fields. But uh, my perspective and the context, historical context, are totally different. But it's, uh, I think it is a very good because of the historical difference. Then the encounter become interesting. So that I look forward to hearing your uh, discussion. So that's why I choose this because I. I know that the, the, uh, the techniques, technology, science are very different mechanically, but they're linked together. So that's why I choose to talk about this issue. Um, the, first, the extensive application of the uh, concept of science is one of the main characteristics of Chinese thought in 20th century. Obviously, it's a part of the issue of the modernity, so-called modernity. Uh, the since later Qing Dynasty, the science has served as a symbol of, and a core for liberation, as well as an objective criteria for all social and cultural reform, as a stand-in for a universalist world of ultra, science has provided not only arguments for the necessity of the reforms, advocates of a new culture, hopeful, but also objectives and paradigms for the reforms. The power of science lies in the fact that it established an intimate connection between a universalist worldview and a kind of the cosmo cosmopolitan and, and also the nationalist social system. And through a rationalized classification of knowledge and the social division of labor, incorporated in its broader genealogy of human life in all its forms and tendencies. So, uh, now I try to talk about some issues here, the branches of learning, positivism, and the social models. The word, the word science in Chinese is a culture. Everybody knows that the culture is one of the most widely used keywords in the 20th century China. Its earliest source comes from the Japanese Linji scholar Nishi Ameni, who is who in 1874 in the Morocco Zashi uh, uh, translated the English word science using the Chinese characters for Kershaw. The Nietzsche was deeply influenced by the positivist philosophy of Auguste Comte and uh, John Stuart Mills. And the term Kershaw was produced under the influence of a Comte as a branch of learning. The Kerr is a subject, like a discipline. So besides the natural sciences, it's also included the religion morality, art, and the society, together providing a universal method that was generally applicable. He translated the philosophy, respectively, as the study of nature and the principle. In Chinese, it's a Confucius idea, the xing yi xue. Study of principle, li xue. We know that the new Confucianism in Song Dynasty, we call it li xue. It's, it's like a philosophy. However, this term was in employed for translating the term of science. So this is the study of exhausting principle, chong li xue, study of the strivings of the wise, is the wisdom, it's about the wisdom. Study of strivings for wisdom. And finally, the settled upon the study of wisdom, zhe xue. This is about the philosophy. But later we know that the same terms were also used for the translation of science too. So the first part of the Shuhaku Saki states is that all of the sciences and te techniques have one thread running through them, which is very critical because having established a unified outlook in study and a technique, people's <coughs> activities can be organized, <coughs> society's order can be stabilized, family and the state can be become powerful and rich, and the study uh, uh, typify the superior man, thus establishing a unified outlook and exhausting the uh, subtleties of study and the technique. But one man cannot do all of these. Therefore, for establishing a unified outlook, it is the philosoph philosopher's role to construct the discussion and the explication, whereas to exhaust the uh, 
the subtleties of the particular study and the technique. These functions belong to the expert in that field. So is it, you see that it, there was a huge genealogy, the structure of knowledge. On the top was the metaphysics. It's an outlook. It's a kind of the metaphysics. Unified outlook, he, he called that. Some people were read these kind of the, the metaphysics were almost a parallel to political thinking about what, what, the role. What, what was the term in Chinese in Mandarin for metaphysics? Tong Yi, no, the Xinhua Shang Xue. But 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 at that time they in the Japanese they used the term of the Tong Yi Guan, unified outlook. So that was the in the in the top. So the parallel led to the political genealogy as the the, the, the emperor was on the top. You know, this is a really parallel, the, uh, the, the structure of the knowledge and the structure mm. of the state or the society. So that's why you find this uh, unified vision and science in a manner similar to early Minji Japan during the later Qing Dynasty. Science, the Kezhe, various studies, Zhuzhe, and uh, other concepts that indicated the fields of knowledge were related to the Western knowledge or Western studies. And these specialist fields of knowledge had been introduced for the purpose of political reform and self-strengthening. So therefore, the use of scientific terms and the translation of Western knowledge had a very close relationship. That's why, actually, the science was the main content of so-called another category, which in Xi Xie, so called Western knowledge. So this is a Western knowledge, right? So in the 1890s, when Chinese scholars began to use the word Persia, its direct source was from Japanese catalog. For example, in the spring of 1898, very famous Chinese reformer, Kang Youwei, edited the catalog of Japanese books published by the Datong Translation Bureau. The question then, we, we, we both went to the question of taxonomy to see that the, how that changed. It is was noting that the titles entered under the school of principle, Li Yuan, its, uh, its subject. In the catalog of Japanese books, mostly included physics, chemistry, calendrics, uh, uh, meteorology, geography, mineralogy, <laughs> biology, philosophy, religious studies, psychology, logic, and morality. So this is not all these were part of the science. Among other volumes were separately arranged the categories from uh, physiology, religion, history, politics, law, agriculture, industry, commerce, education, literature, linguistics, aesthetics, novels, military works. The divisions are not very strict, but is truly categorized according to the nature and the function of the various studies or branches of learning. So in 1902, Liang Qichao, another very in influential Chinese in intellectual in that time, in a note on the, uh, the relation between the geography and the civilization, defined the science in this way, anything which becoming a field, that the subject or the discipline of study is called a science. This is like investigating things and extending knowledge. That is a confusion term. And the various studies, that's now the, uh, the old term became the new term. The same characters, same word. Here, the extent of the field of study is uh, comparatively broader than the extent of Gerzhi, that uh, the investing things uh, to reach the knowledge. And uh, the notion of various studies with the branches of learning as a precondition also has a relation to the later Qing educational system reform. So, as with the difference of the position in Nietzsche's philo uh, philosophy uh, or the unified vision with his science of sciences, he saw that the metaphysics as a science of sciences. Later Qing Chinese scholars were prone to use the concept of groups that the Qing or the later were translated into the society, that, that, that used the term the Qing, and the category of sociology, the Qing Xue to unify the fields of knowledge, thus placing the classification of the study of fields of knowledge within the frame of an ideal model of society. So it's different from like Nishi. He used the metaphysics as the top of the knowledge. 
the, for Yan Fu, for example, later we, he tried to put the sociology at the top of that. So this is a, we can explain why this is the, this pattern is derived from the Kont, August the Kont and Herbert Spencer's sociology. And the concept of the group in Asian and Chinese thought is a combination. Thus, the branches of learning are closely related to the overall view of society, the universe, and the nature. This also implies that the science and its system have a close relationship with the concept of the new social community. According to the Confucian thought, the group is the law under the heaven and the common nature of all things. It involves not studying but knowing, not worrying but being able to do. That is the principle, so called of the nature, and it is one with the principle of morality. Because of this, the term various studies is not a mixed up chaos of knowledge classification, but is directly connected with the technique of the sociology of politics and the education. So the general outlook of science embodies the modern states, politics, the ethical and the technical structure in the organic whole. Following Spencer's concepts in sociology, Yan Fu, who was the translator, very famous translator of Adam Smith, uh, uh, John Stuart Mill, and Montesquieu, and all those figures, he's a very great translator and also the thinker. He's a quite a uh, uh, very crucial. is a crucial figure. He's a very important figure. Uh, he used the structure of the heaven, earth, and the man to establish a system of knowledge. You know that the, the, uh, the, the heaven, earth, and the man was the traditional taxonomy. Let's say this is the whole about the description of the cosmos. Relates to the nature of society and the morality, and in its discipline, that the highest position is the metaphysics, or the study of re refining the mind and the controlling affairs. Situated at the pot, uh, bottom is the mathematics, chemistry, electricity, botany. Below, to the middle level, is the agriculture, military science, navigation, mechanics, medicine, and the mining. So, Yan Fu's metaphysics is closely uh, connected to the sociology. It's a little bit <coughs> different from Nietzsche's idea. So the former mainly uh, includes the mathematics and the calculus. It is a type of knowledge which can comprehensively hold the object's principle of inevitability. While the latter is capable of applying the inductive and deductive methodology to politics, criminal law, finance, historiography, and other fields of sociology. According to his understanding, using the methods of classification and the primary evidence, science provided a new social model and a new principle of morality. <laughs> Needless to say that his category of the uh, so-called change or the sociology was different from the sociology as a discipline. You know, at that time, it is a really almost the function of it, almost like the metaphysics, which can control the whole the knowledge, the, 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 and the, the decided the, the principle to make the taxonomy or the reclassification of knowledge. So, the, the from later Qing, let's see, talk about something to go back to the, the, the new Confucian roots of the, uh, the, the, these kind of the uh, girl and the missionaries writing. The from later Qing up to the May 4th, new cultural movement, that's the, uh, the first decades of 20th century. Science was translated into Chinese in many ways, which Kezhue being one among them. Gezhizhue, Gewuzhue, Chonglizhue, Lizhue, Li Ke, and others all came from Confucianism, particularly from the Songming school of principles discussion of the study of things to acquire knowledge. But during the Ming and the Qing era, these became connected with knowledge of nature. This kind of the translation is, of course, the, the traditional knowledge of, of in, investigating things is related to the nature. But now, gradually, folks are the study of nature. So this is the, uh, the difference. So in Chinese, sometimes we, in the Ming and the Qing, we use the term of bo wu xie. It's uh, bo wu xie, like a, a museum, bo wu xie, you know, the bo wu xie, everything. It's actually the bo wu xie was the, uh, the, the study of nature. 
This kind of translation had its origin in missionary writings. The missionaries used the Confucian terms to translate the Western concept of science and technology. Some examples include the uh, Martin, uh, W. A. P. Martin's 1868 publication, Girl <coughs> Ruman, who was the translator of international law. We know that the uh, Quitten's international law, the first the international law translated into Chinese in 1864, it was him. Then that was also exported to, to Japan. So that became the new knowledge about the global system that uh, played a quite important uh, role there. So in 1874, the British consulate located in Shanghai proposed establishing a Gezhi Shu Yuan in the manner of the reading room. Afterwards, on the John Fry's proposal and the, and the board's approval, uh, it was established as an industry and a technology school and a natural sciences research and educational institution. Its English name was the Chinese Polytech Institution and the Reading Room. The use of Gezhi, Go, and other concepts was not limited to missionary writing and the practice. Chinese scholars and modern intellectuals also used these terms widely. Before the 1902, the use of the word Gezhi was rare. For example, in 1861, Feng Guifen, another reformer, initiated subjects in Western learning, such as mathematics, mechanics, perspectives, uh, optics, chemistry, all of these concerning the investigation of things to reach the underlying basic principle. So that, what, what, what the crucial term, I think the uh, concept, Transform here. We use the same Chinese character, that the Wu, but the, its whole meaning, connotation, transform fundamentally. The reason that the Confucian category, Go Zhi Zhi, was able to be used to translate the modern concept of science lies in the transformation of the concept of Wu, material, objects, <coughs> things, all we can, we use the Wu to translate, which is a crucial point. Within the context of the classical ritual and the music, Wu was not an isolated objective fact, but was a thing within a certain relationship, system, order, and norm. Under the great office, in the offices of Earth section of the ritual of Jodi, that there was a passage in the district that they used the three merits to teach them multitudes and to treat them as guests and recommend them. The three merits refer to the six virtues. You see, the six aspects of the conduct and, uh, and the six arts. That the, so that's why the Wu was the demonstration of a natural order. While ritual and the music, it's like a, a still enchanted order, which means that a certain kind of natural order containing the meaning of moral meaning, the significance of the meaning, is different. It's not the disenchanted world. It's not the... It's a bare, it's a bare world. It's not, it's not the uh, so. Uh, while the ritual music was, were also the direct embodiment of the natural order. Therefore, the Wu of natural ordering is also the model of ritual and music. That's so, in the Song and the Ming New Confucianism, the relation of Wu and the ordering of ritual became distant. It no longer directly presented a norm for ritual but it had to pass through the investigating thing to, in order to win the principle. Because the Wu itself, as an object, cannot provide your norms for your behavior. However, the norms came from the, the, the old idea of the ordering, is a ritual and the rites, but that lost in the history. So, but how can you get the knowledge about that, the, the ritual knowledge? You need to study the, the Wu go through it to achieve that knowledge. So this is about the historical transformation. The <coughs> idea consciousness of history will play the role of the transformation of the concept of Wu. So that related why, so that's why that kind of the concept, the transformation, actually related to the full <coughs> transformation of the order. That's why the form of the heavenly view of the world. The Song Ming Confucius saw the heavenly principle as the characteristic of all things, the source of ethics and the norm of 
for the implementation and I took it as the basis for the integration of nature, ethics and politics and other aspects. Similar to these, the concepts of modern science and the Gertrude centered on the research into and application of nature. Moreover, they often had a mutual license with the categories of politics, ethics, and the social ordering. Therefore, the fall of the heavenly view of the world and the rise of the scientific worldview in the later Qing times was not a simple relationship of the rise and the fall, but they existed at the same time permitting each other because they both tried to reconstruct the ordering, the whole cosmos, and the order. So that's why the concept of science in late 19th century to early 20th century had a very close relationship to the category of evolution, progress, natural change. By means of an intense critique of thought, the scientific worldview ultimately replaced the new Confucian outlook of the heavenly principle and it became the new public principle that almost like an axiomic, established on the basis of knowledge of objective law. So that is uh, the rupture between the so-called heaven and the public or the axiom. It's a very mathematic idea. So in a great number of documents dating from the later Qing era to the May 4th moment, we can summarize the sharp opposition between the heavenly principle worldview and the public principle worldview from several perspectives. First, the public principle worldview reversed the historical outlook of the heavenly principle worldview. <coughs> the future and not the past came to be viewed as the root, origin, of the uh, idea of politics and the morality put into practice because we know that the, the Confucianism always talking about the time of sage kings is in the past but now it is the evolution progressive and so on and so forth it's related to the, to the new idea of time the second the public principle worldview through a straightforward linear time concept replaced the heavenly principle worldview based on the circumstances of, of the time or the condition of reason, so circumstances of time or the propensity of time or the forces of time. The time is not abstract, it's not linear, it's always linked to the certain circumstances, linked to the situation and uh, we mutually construction with the subject <coughs> intervention. So that was the, the new idea, that is the, the idea, the Confucian idea about the time. So this is a very different, this is a very important change of the two conceptions of time. Third, the public principle world outlook used the method of atomic theory to construct a category of facts. So now the Wu became the facts. That's very important issue. And these shook up the pre-packaged the metaphysics of the heavenly principle world outlook attempting instead to construct the basis of ethics and the politics according to the logic of facts and the rule of nature. Because of the final establishment of the factual concept of the atomic, atomic theory, any resistance to the logic of facts or the laws of nature must recognize the precondition of the dualism, facts and the value. So that's we talk about the, in the Scottish the philosophy that Hume and to talk about the dualism and so on. That, from my point of view, it's not uh, started from the metaphysical hypothesis. It's really started from historical transformation. That the replacement of the new sci scientific <coughs> worldview and in which the new concept of fact or the object were constructed. So in that sense, replaces the traditional concept of Wu. Then you have the, the dualism value and the facts or the, the uh, this is the, uh, uh, the, the my argument um, so I think that uh, there were different kind of the approach to to reconstruct the different ideas maybe I have no uh, how, 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 long, how long time uh, go on longer if you'd like yeah. <laughs> no, no, okay. Okay, sure. I'm sorry. Um, I try to be to be to be limited. I mean, 
Uh, the different, let's try it. Uh, branches of orthodox Confucianism have a variety of different <coughs> explanations for heavenly principle and investigating things to acquire knowledge. Similarly, modern Chinese thinkers also include different paths to the understanding of science. I very simply, very briefly, to summarize different approaches. One is Yan Fu, I mentioned him. That and Liang Qichou represents the direction of two main streams as the fusion of the school of Confucianism, the Song Xue, the uh, Chen Zhu Li Xue, and the modernism. Yan Fu's public principle outlook stress the world's innate uniformity, recognizing that one can understand the innate laws of the universe, the world, and, uh, and the man himself by means of investigating things and exhausting principle or through empirical methods. They believe that uh, if you could only follow this logic, then you can be a moral person. Not only, so this is the, the, the idea. While the Liang Jitao is different, the combination of the mind and the heart school, he's a Xin Xue, the Wang Yangming, the Ming Confucianism, the new learning of classics school, and the philo philosophical dualism, particularly the German idealist philosophy, and the William James pragmatism, that the kind of the the certain kind of dualism were constructed. The moral world, and that the only method that can connect these two worlds, is the implementation of the unity of knowledge and the practice. So this is the, uh, the two kind of uh, two kind of the mainstream of the understanding of knowledge. Now I try to highlight some people who are really different. It's uh, in, in in their opposite. Uh, that's uh, Zhang Taiyan. Zhang Taiyan was famous, the revolutionary and the editor of Ming Bao. That's the, the periodical of revolution periodical. And uh, you know, maybe, maybe many people know that the Lu Xun, who was the most famous uh, novelist, uh, Chinese writer, uh, Zhang Taiyan uh, was his teacher. So he was a very, very <coughs> interesting figure. For him, so-called axiom or the public principle is only a power to oppress and dominate. So already talk about knowledge and power there in a critical way, I think. <coughs> Zhang Taiyan's exposure of scientific public principle is based on two fundamental principles. First, he used the principle of subjective epistemology to differentiate the two kinds of concepts of nature, two kinds of the nature. Nature, as studied by science, was not self-existing, existent nature, <coughs> but is a nature brought into a specific horizon and a category, and this nature lacks an innate essence. It shows itself only in a pattern, that is, the law of causality. So he started from these arguments, from the drones of philosophy and the Buddhism. So secondly, he liberates moments of nature from the framework of the te uh, uh, teleology, negating any moral connotation of evolution, thus rejecting the associating individuals with the historical teleology, teleology of evolution, refusing to admit that the individual's ethical orientations are based on the laws of movement for the whole of the society, rejecting that the individual should be looked upon as an instrument of group evolution. So these are also studied from the Zhuangzi philosophy and the Buddhism, but obviously there was a critique of idea of time, the linear time. So basically this, this is a, also came from his understanding of history. <coughs> so again, these kind of the backgrounds, so-called the new <coughs> two culture, that the, the uh, if it's not talking about these were the new culture emerged in Chinese context too. So if we were to compare the dissemination, of course, the different context and the practice of science among late chain intellectuals with the scientific commu communities of the Republican period and their practice, we would find a distinct shift Chinese science organizations and other scientific bodies and the appearance of the specialized academic periodicals <laughs> are an indication that the Republican China's culture field embodied a clear-cut difference 
between the scientific culture and the culture of humanities. While during the later change, the dissemination of science was the organic part of the dissemination of reform and the revolution. As a result, two clear-cut differences were constructed between the scientific culture and other cultures. Science itself, or science uh, as a vocabulary term, became the closely associated with the objective or the concept of the objectivity. Scientific bodies and their activities using their special discipline, training, method, and accurately defined concepts reconstructed the man's basic understanding of nature and humanity itself. Not only did the new concepts arising from scientific activities such as time, space, elements, atoms, molecules, electricity, steam, energy, uh, geologic system expand the man's view of the universe and the nature, but it also fundamentally changed the man's imagined picture of the world. Therefore, the influence of science and its interrelated concepts has far surpassed the division of two cultures becoming a universal law to measure progress and backwardness, truth and falsity, right and wrong. <coughs> so, during the later chain, civilizations and the competition between them held an important historical meaning for China's scientific concepts. People recognized that the scientific research and the resulting social roles were the major reason that the Western society had won the competition of civilization. So now the, uh, the idea of, of science they can link to the idea of the clash of civilizations. Again, okay. this is a very political one. According to this judgment, the importance of science originated from the judgment concerning the new circumstances at that time and didn't re re uh, originate in science itself. With this backdrop, later Qing scientific publication developed a method for understanding the science during the debate on the civilizational conflicts. Its major characteristic being to situate science in the relations of Eastern and Western civilizations, spiritual or the material civilization, as so as to investigate the significance of science. However, after the May 4th, the East and Western culture debates, science and its association with a specific historical culture gradually was replaced by a type of universal narrative about the scientific times. That uh, Chen Duxiu, who was the, uh, the leading figure in the May 4th movement, he said, today the world has two roads. One is a bright road that goes toward a republic, science, and theism. And the other is a dark road that goes toward a dictatorship superstition and the divine rights of kings or emperors. So that is the basically more, much more scientist, uh, scientific views of, of science. However, this I don't, I, I want to skip that. But most interesting thing is the debate over Eastern and Western civilization started in the style of historic cultural narratives and on both sides, discussion of the legitimacy of Eastern Western civilization rely on the historical narratives of the respective cultures. This debate took culture and civilization as its key points. The focus of argument was over which culture and its value could be taken as a standard or goal for establishing the changing direction of China's society, culture, and nation. We can largely summarize the basic views of Another, uh, the so-called, the, uh, by uh, Ali to describe it as a last confusion. Obviously, not are there now. There's a lot of uh, confusions emerged in China currently. So, obviously, he may be the, the first one in the modern time, not the last one in modern time. But let's see. This is a very important. I think I summarize his the, uh, the, the uh, his idea in the following schematic. Eastern. Eastern civilization equal to the metaphysics, equal to the art, equal to the opinion, metaphysical social talk, new man, private morality, returning to the past, the second, third direction. The second is Chinese direction. Third is the Indian direction. You thought that the Eastern culture is like this. 
So then, what is the uh, the West? The Western civilization included the science, learning, knowledge, ethics, phenom phenomena, public morality, modernization. That's the first direction. So this is a grand, grand narrative of evolution. Started from the West through China, via China to India. So this is the he argued for that. He saw that uh, it's a reverse the whole views. He saw the East on the top in, 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 the, in the end of the evolution. So in Liang's discussion of culture, science is not only a problem of knowledge, metaphysics is not only a problem concerning ethics, but they indicate two different civilization problems represented by science and metaphysics. So in scientific civilizations, all science, politics, economics, ethics, law, and philosophy belong to the science, rationalized, understood. But in the metaphysical civilization, all science, politics, economics, everything was the uh, metaphysical. It's the, the, that's the that's division of that. So, but it's, it's because of this, because it, after the, the 19, uh, especially uh, 1919, that uh, the Mayor Force movement, the, the idea of science dominated. So there was some resistance against that. This time, in uh, 1923, there was a very important uh, debate, which not is different from the East and Western debate. It's a debate between the science and the metaphysics, or the life outlook. Eventually, they try to reorganize the taxon taxonomy of knowledge. All these, all these, the terms or the concepts, which were employed to describe the character, the, the nature of Eastern civilization, belong to like ethics, aesthetics, in intuition, and the instinct and so on and so forth. Those others were employed by Liang Shuming to describe the, the Western civilization. Now became the. Uh, science, physics, uh, chemistry, mathematics, and so on and so forth. So in that sense, they reorganized the taxonomy of knowledge to try to keep the division between the natural science, social science, humanities. So it's not, so in that sense, now became a very objective genealogy of knowledge. Looks, it's a, really a system of knowledge. However, that kind of the knowledge will assimilate early idea about the civilizations. So that's why all these Eastern civilizations, well, it's difficult to define the Eastern civilization <coughs> as a field for the scientific research. Only Needham did the work. Mm -hmm. Say, before that, uh, already in China had uh, quite developed the technology, science, and so on and so forth. But scientific research only belonged to that Western level. So it, but, but at that time, the Western East, that category disappeared from that te uh, taxonomy. So it's a unified taxonomy, reorganized. In the 1923, that debate happened. The same year that the, 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 the Ministry of Education decided, launched the reform of, of the education system, reorganized the university system, that the, all the disciplines constructed for these. So this is the, uh, the basic, uh, I think that the, that's why I, uh, I, I only read the last page, I don't want to talk too much. Right. Let's talk about the rise of the uh, humanities. The humanities as a field were defined differently from the science, right? However, you can see that the, that started from the debates between the traditional learning and the Western modern learning, all the Eastern civilization, Western civilization, eventually reorganized into the new taxonomy as a whole. So the using the diversity of the spirit to oppose the universality of science, using the diversity of culture and history to oppose the universalism of scientific civilization, using the differences in the principle of the subject to oppose the united principle of the common standards principle of science, this is a historical connotation of science and a, a philosophy of life as a pair of opposing rhetorical mo mode. By opposing science with the philosophy of life, the problem of history and the culture was ultimately transformed into a problem about the abstract and universal knowledge. It was not a difference of Chinese essence and the Western function, 中体西用, 
all the confrontation of the Eastern and the Western civilization, but it was the opposition of the science and the metaphysics, physics and the psychology, reason and intuition, which structured center of the discussion. So with these as the axis, the system universal scientific knowledge began to split apart into a incommensurate rate, differing independent fields, that is the field of science and the field of the spirit, that are the humanities. So uh, the difference between the, uh, the, the psychology studies and the natural subject didn't prevent the males from the promoting in the methodology the scientific scientification of the psychology and the sociology, while the orientation of like a cousin John, the Zhang Jingmai, is a uh, key figure, okay, one minute, <laughs> were in the opposite direction, which John clearly striving to strictly differentiate the psychology, sociology, and the political science from physics, astronomy, and other scientific fields. Basically, I think from then on, to now, the, the whole fields and the new taxonomy of structure and the uh, structure of the, the disciplines within the university and the education system was structured from that time. So that's what I stop here. So mm -hmm. thank you. Sorry for the. Probably best to move straight on to Berner, I think. Would you like? If that's okay? I think, yeah, and then discussion, both together. Uh, and we've here, and we've taken the chair. Thank you very much for this very interesting uh, description of the history of knowledge in China. I will give a lecture next week in America about the question of categorization of knowledge in, in, in Western society. And maybe I will, I will give you a, a, a lecture because we could have a discussion with your topic for today. Myself, I will speak about the difference between modernity and modernization. Today. Modernization is a process triggered by a dynamism of technical invention constituting what is called by the French historian Bertrand Gilles the technical system. This constitution of technical system is not a specifically modern fact. It is constitutive of all technical nature, as uh, Bertrand Gilles showed. However, modernity and modernization as the process made possible by it, and which makes it possible in return, is what creates the conditions of totally unprecedented dynamic of the technical system in so much as it jolts social systems and which ends up conflicting with them, in particular since the expansion of industrial mechanization. It is why Bertrand Gilles evokes, it's, it's not a, an English term, it's a neologism, these adjustments to characterize what becomes obvious <coughs> in the 19th century as an industrial revolution. The nation state is what takes over the predictable consequences of these disadjustments and what never stops amending the social systems in order to cope. For all that, the modernizing dy dynamism of the technical system as it tends structurally to modify the other social systems by forming with them a dynamic system typical of modernity <coughs> begins well before industrialization. It is set up with the age of discovery. And it is essentially tied to the appearance of printing, which determines the birth of humanism. Determines or <coughs> conditions the birth of humanism. Inasmuch as it leads to a chronic 
conflict between the technical system and the other social systems. So this adjustment characterizing modernization is a specific mode of the process of psychical, collective, and technical individuation in the sense of Gilbert Semingo, which characterizes all human history as a transformation. What points it out as a modern individuation process is the formation of the conscience of the will to transform that characterizes conscious and will were at first but those of a small part of the population that would form along with the industrial revolution the modern mentality tending to organize the whole society's ways of life which would translate into a reversal of the rural urban relation and ending up in the formation of a modern society which would thus constitute a completion point for modernity. Starting from the Industrial Revolution, modernization explicitly turned into the organization of a political economy of disadjustment. 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 Disadjustment, yes. At the time when the whole society tended to become modern, that is when an economy of innovation developed itself and when magazines, the, les magasins de nouveauté, as we say in French, appeared. But as they constitute the first edges of modernity caused by the onset of the process of modernization, and as they predate by far <coughs> this modern society, modern times, modern philosophy, and the quarrel of the ancient and the modern structurally conceal the modernization process itself as it is a dynamism of technical invention in its systematicity. Indeed, modernity builds up on the basis of humanism in the capacity of the formation of subjectivity as a conscious and a will funding the objectivizing mastery of nature. Yet, by setting itself up as a conquest of objectivity through the mastery of computability, modern subjectivity is paradox paradoxically what conceals the technical dynamism by defining itself as its cause and by sim simultaneously reducing technology to a means. To a means. 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 Means, means. means. By denying that the future of technology is what transforms the individuation process for which technology constitutes a milieu and not merely a means. On the contrary of what modern metaphysics has been attempting to form as the foundation of a Mathesis universal supposedly born of the evidences of subjectivity in its certainty of its originary transcendentality. It is a modernization process which, as a series of <coughs> technical mutations, makes this philosophy of the subject possible, thus being not the consequence of the mastery of objectivity by this subjectivity, but rather the cause of a mutation a rationalization of which is this philosophy of the subject self-defining itself as a master and a possessor of nature of the Nuteka. Everyone is now carefully discovering the limitations of this rationalization and the subtle metaphysical illusions it involves. Society at a global level and not just lettered criticism would encounter those limitations and think them under different names like postmodernity, reflexive modernity, and radical modernity. As a conscious and will 
of a modern subject form itself in the modernization process in which printing obviously plays a central role as a new age form, for Nemata. That is to say as a second technological revolution of grammatization. I was speaking with Sylvain Oru. Modernity is a rationalizing theorization of the disadjustment provoked by the modernization process and a concealment of its being a disadjustment. This concealment is unavoidable in the sense that this theorization lacks a concept of technology and of the technical system which would allow a thought of the disadjustment as such. Not only in such a concept missing, but it is what, since the origins of philosophy and as these origins themselves, Platonism, has made intrinsically unthinkable by philosophy and after it by all Western knowledge, precisely because of his condemnation of hypomnemata, that is, mnemotechniques in the sense of Plato, and because of the Sophists misusing them. The entire modern theoretical legacy as a philosophy of the subject and precisely because it is theoretical, then results from an opposition between science and technology, hence between transcendentalism and empirism. This opposition stands in the way of the thought of technology. Yet the limitations and paradoxes of such a legacy become apparent when Owen modernization process, science and technology build up new links in the dynamic of industrial innovation in Western society as techno-science and as the main constituting, fa constituting factors not only of modern philosophy of the subject but more of a modern society, namely an industrial society. It is because they foresee the necessity to overcome this concealment that deconstruction and postmodernism matter. But they only partially <coughs> open the door. This is why they do not suffice to think what is happening to us now, a modernization without modernity. The spread of modernity is what economically and socially materializes after colonization and after the reformation as what Max Weber calls the process of disenchantment, the conditions of which pre-modernity produces. The first signs of a pre-industrial capitalism appear within modern times in the sense of philosophy, modernity and led to the process of widespread rationalization. But modernity only becomes this rational, ratio, rationalization, and at least in America, at the reign of the computability of divine essence, because it is a religious origin, as shown by Weber's analysis of Benjamin Franklin's sermon insofar as in its capacity of, body, of modernity permanently produces re-enchantment. Yet at a time when modernize, modernization intensifies and, globali and globalizes itself, and when we can and must characterize it as a rationalization materialized as a technology, and also as a disadjustment of the social systems provoked by this materialization of rationalization in the form of a system which is not only technical, but technological, and thereby global as a ubiquitary real-time system, 
as well as one of the just-in-time response. Modernity defaults us precisely because it constituted itself as this capacity to re-enchant what is disenchanted. A modern enchantment was spontane spontaneously generated by disenchantment itself, whether it was a discourse on mastery become enlightenment philosophy, a great emancipation, emancipation tale, or modern art. Of course, because of secularization and industrialization, it could only be a relative re-enchantment. The absolute enchantment was gone. God was dying. But one that put this enchantment itself into, in perspective, into perspective. Yet, in the 21st century, and especially on September 11, 9, 2001, humanity enters into an experience of modernization without modernity. Of a modernization therefore lived as paradoxically but intrinsically regressive. This period co corresponds to an absolute disenchantment in the sense that the latter does not produce any form of re-enchantment anymore. In this respect, it constitutes the term of the disenchantment process described by Max Weber one century and it requires the renewal of his analysis. This term is the center of Anthony Giddens' work as a radical modernity, or Ulrich Becks as a reflexive modernity, or of Jean-Francois Lyotard as a post-modernity. However, these works are limited by a great underestimation on the, part, on the part of all three thinkers of the enchanted dimension of modernity. The disenchantment process described by Max Weber is indeed only possible on the condition that motivation is reconstituted in the sense that, in a way, it regrows all the more so vigorously as it is regularly moved by rationalization, as long as modernity socializes modernization. Yet absolute disenchantment, on the contrary, <coughs> is the ordeal of the absence of all reason, an absolute absence, that is to say a total void, <coughs> bearing no relation anymore with the absent of all bouquets for speaking with the poet Stéphane Mallarmé, which as an ideal flower enchants all flowers, he says. The garden becomes a dessert. <coughs> it is a question of Nietzsche and nihilism. The chance, if there is a chance, would lie in the question of enchantment as it is asked for the first time as such, and as the ordeal of its flow by such a situation. This question is asked as that of a mystagogy. For example, as what I have called contemporary art mystagogy. And such as this mystagogy is libido's most secret. Mystagogy is unsolvable because, first, there is no fantasy without such a mystagogy. Second, there is no desire without such a fantasy. Third, there is no psychic, collective, and technical individuation, which means no sustainable transformation without such a desire, that is without motivation. And fourth, desire is this 
alchemical process of transformation which Sigmund Freud calls sublimation. And out of, out of which no economy and no street of individuation are possible. The chance would then consist in the absolute disenchantment being the meeting point of a necessity, the one Georges Bataille called general economy, which I believe must be rethought as libidinal ecology. <coughs> Until the 18th century, the world appears essentially stable to the ordinary man. From the 19th century, in Europe and America, when modernity becomes modern society, the world appears more and more unstable. Disenchantment is this passage from a stable world to an unstable one, <clears throat> and this passage is the great transformation that gives birth to the industrial, urban, secularized, laborious, and consumer society. Modernity as modern times, that is, as philosophy, is what starts before modern society, well before, and what pronounces and or announces either with a speech or through social organizations materializing such a speech as a project, modernizations, metaphysical conditions of possibility, and epistemological, economical, legal, political, spiritual, artistic, cultural, and industrial conditions of possibility. But it also is what limits it, or at least what inscribes the modernization process on the schedule. It is what makes sure that modernization, rather than modernity, as the title of a book by Anthony Giddens suggests, has coherent consequences as well as conditions. Coherence as an adjustment, ajustement in French, of the social systems to the ceaselessly accelerated becoming of the technical system, but also as anticipation and regulation of these adjustments to come. <laughs> this schedule builds up as a political speech for the industrial democracies as a consequence of the later giving form to a political will as a project of a subject transforming objects and thus ceaselessly bringing out new objects through the action of its auto-production. In that, modernity is not only a discourse on the subject's will, but also on the general will, along with Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and the multiple political versions of people's emancipation. Yet, this emancipation process falls within the core of what Peter Sloterdijk describes these days as a history of a, it's a neologism in English, disinhibition. A will to power of which modernization is the instrumentation, the coming of which Nietzsche pronounces by announcing the hard news of nihilism. As a global achievement of this process of this inhibition, modernization goes on today without modernity. And that means it is not wanted anymore. The disinhibition is what drives will to exhaustion. The exhaustion of politically organized desire. In this context, modernization has become more and more often, and particularly in France, what is not accepted anymore, what is rejected rather than, rather than projected. For example, as technology for, of the living, as nanotechnology, but also as technology in general. <coughs> and it is now the National Front which is coming in France, and which we had the power in France in three years. It's absolutely sure. It also is more and more often, excuse me, modernization, no, 
it's also now more often what is rejected as contemporary art, European projects, new industrial division of labor and techno science, as well as the different kinds of behaviors produced by marketing that appear to be destroying the social fabric itself. Modernization without modernity has become very deeply undesirable. In other words, it is what generates an anti-modernity. But not that of the writers studied by Antoine Compagnon, for example, precisely as there are these writers, exemplary figures of modernity starting with Baudelaire but one of a creeping global populism, a global trolling. In the industrial democracies as well as in the new industrial countries, in rich unindustrialized countries, and in countries excluded from modernity as well as modernization, crushed by poverty and neglect. And neglect. In this context, nationalisms and fundamentalism are the costly truth of absolute <coughs> and global disenchantment. The great difficulty not to fall <coughs> into those the active tendencies lies in the fact that the modernization process, if it is not guided by a modern project, is nonetheless orchestrated and driven by an ideology according to which public initiative has become obsolete, and it is thus necessary to give up all regulation and let the market forces play without rules. These very active tribes of the ruins, on the ruins of the modern project and constitute a strategy. It is not a project precisely in as much as this strategy out of principle denies all possibility to project oneself on the long term and consequently to anticipate and desire a future. Modernization without modernity is thus what corresponds to the victory of financial capital on industrial capital. Therefore, an immense confusion makes those rejecting these modernization without modernity appear like anti-modernist while the modernizers, while they deny all modern projects and all possibility of long-term projection which actually make impossible by imposing their strategy pretend they are the only modern against those they denounce as conservative and in whom they see that reactionary people afraid of the future, whereas they themselves are precisely the ones who destroy this future with their strategy, which exactly proves in this it's being radical, anti-modern. Consequently, another approach must be found to draw from this picture a third way is a fine line that I refuse to cross because I think what has been called a third way never asked the question the way it should have been, which is as a question of thought of long term, which I will do my best to show its supposes the reconstruction of a libidinal economy and as a libidinal ecology. This future results from globalization, itself resulting from the deterritorialization of modernization, cases of which the outsourcing phenomena are, which is now driven by unlimited financialization. The conduct of modernization by the global financialization has totally evaded the states and this there, with them, every other form of political power in such a way that the growth of a global economic network has finally led to a pure and simple identification of the technological future 
which is the concrete reality of modernization, with the markets. This confusion gradually occurred between modernity and markets, secreting an anti-modernity as well as an anti-modernization, rejecting both technoscience and globalization, words which have almost become synonyms. Politically and culturally, and culturally, this translates into a deeply reactionary, archaic process, regressive in all respects, and provoking an immense disorientation in those who have not yet yielded to it. Being against modernity had thus ended up meaning being against the markets. But why being against the <coughs> supremacy? or against what has been called more or less rightfully market societies, <laughs> has become synonymous of being against modernity. At the same time, modernity is confused with this modernization devoid of any project other than the unlimited increase of gain due to financial speculation at a global level. If Georges Pompidou wanted to symbolize modernity in France through the creation of the National Art and Culture Center, bearing his name, the Centre Pompidou, where I am a worker. <laughs> Valérie Giscard d'Estaing wanted modernization and opposed the Pompidou project during that decade which will have been that of the first symptoms of the collapse of the modern project. François Mitterrand followed on this Giscardian modernization without asking the political question of modernity anew, which created a de facto postmodernity in France. France was a postmodern state, that is, a, a ruin of state, partially anticipated and theorized by Jean François Lyotard. Theorized by Lyotard. Postmodernity is characterized by a coincidence of both modernization and the market's extension. <coughs> and without this raising the, less, the least doubt, nor therefore any debate, which the, thus leads to the hegemony of economic and political short-termism. Today, a little more than 12 years after the 11th, 2001 meta catastrophe. We are living the obviousness <laughs> and thus the anxiety and therefore the unconsidered of the fact that there are new forms of modernization and that the discourse of postmodernity does not allow us to think them. Postmodernity would be more a symptom of a blockage before modernization rather than a thought of modernization. If it is true that thinking is also providing oneself with the means to act. These new forms of modernization are not only within the field of what Ulrich Beck called a recessive <coughs> modernity, giving birth to another modernity, even if these two states of affairs are in close relationship. And one of the stakes of the revival of this debate is precisely to evaluate the impact as well as the limitations of Ulrich Beck and Anthony Giddens proposals. What relationship is there between modernity as it formed in Western Europe as far as we know what is designated this way? And the idea the ways of life, social organizations, economic models, and socializations of technology that come out of modernization's new continents. Obviously, there is one, and it is at the least a technological and economic one. It forms a new system for the division of labor and the formation of markets. But apart from that, is there a process of invention for ways of life which would echo the invention stemming from modernity and which would bring about a new dynamic 
in the individuation process formed by humanity as a whole. One must will to believe so <coughs> or for it, but it will undoubtedly need to be provoked and therefore organized. Because ways of life, contrary to a widespread illusion, are not spon spontaneously generated, and in the modernization process, less than ever. Anthropotechnics, biopolitical technologies, and psycho powers of marketing are the reality of those controlled societies which came after disciplinary societies, and where the industrial manufacturing of behaviors has become the main activity of the mighty. Modernization, as well as the modernity, which is an age of it, is the organization of an adoption process where behaviors are established as patterns and spread all over the world. Nonetheless, such a psychopolitics of adoption requests a particular psychical mechanism themselves controlled by the libidinal economy and energy constituting the subjects as the questions of what is desirable and what is not. <laughs> what can be globally desirable or undesirable? This is a question to be asked in the perspective of the current shift of the possibilities of modernization out of the borders of the West. That is to say, outside of the European and American continents, but also outside of Japan, and as an acceleration of the process of modernization is and which François Bitter describes a Swiss uh, citizen as a chain reaction, he says, in the sense of nuclear reaction. What had been containing, both in the senses of holding back and of holding, the literally heart-rending effects of modernization, disruption of the landscape, the social structure, the economy, the border, the exchange, etc., and that had been regulated by the spirit and the project of various Western modernities, now materializes itself in an all other setting which literally unleashes the process and brings forward the hyper-acceleration of chain reaction. Given that the modernization created by Western modernity already constituted, essentially and per se, an acceleration process of the future because of the new relationship between technology and science built up at the end of the 19th century, of the 18th century, excuse me, which led to what Habermas in the, in the 20th century described as technoscience. It is in such a context that we, Europeans of Western Europe, Americans from both North and South, as well as the Japanese and other Indian inhabitants of Earth stemming from Western Europe, such, such as Australian and many other modernizers of existence, <coughs> based on the modernity discourse outside of Western Europe, like in Turkey, for example, or in post-colonial history, etc., etc., have thus moved from a desired modernization beyond the disadjustment and beyond the struggles, those disadjustments never stopped creating <coughs> the name of various figures of modern enchantment, which thus opposed one another <coughs> to this required modernization because of certain countries for forcing us, like China, to adopt modernization reasons <laughs> and aims which are not ours. However, in what way does this situation involve chance opening shifts? What unexpected and maybe unhoped for can come out of the decoupling between modernization and modernity that is also between industrial future and the West? Indeed, the question asked by contemporary modernization 
primarily deploys itself inside what the historical spaces of modernity were, and through a transformation of modernity. The source of modernization's discontents is not its uprooting from modernity's historical errors. Modernization without modernity outside of modernity's historical territories is a context of modernization's discontents. Certainly a major one, but not a cause. Because this modernization process, in its rupture with modernity, grew in Europe and in America in the first place, and maybe also in Japan and in other countries where modernity constituted itself. Because modernization, when lived uh, under the rebel by the public opinions, which formed throughout modernity, but also by victims of this modernization in the countries where it is happening, setting up a new global division of labor imposed by the victory of financial capitalism over industrial capitalism, results in the hegemonic domination of calculation over motivation. The effects of demotivation stemming from this having, have begun to be analyzed by Luc Boltanski and Les Piafello in France as a loss of the producer's agreement to the project and the spirit of capitalism, which in very truth appears to have lost its mind as well as, as, well as its spirit, the latter consisting in a psychical as well as social capacity to sublimate the, deser the, the desirable. Yet this means that modernization without modernity is what modernizes under the sole condition that the, the desirable be eliminated. <coughs> the desirable as what only modernity was able to produce from modernization and as what Anna Arendt called a durable object, that is to say, as an unconsumable object projection screen of a fidelity and beyond that of a trust and a filia of the subjects and capital in this sense of producing bounding through its projection <coughs> in the difference with the A, the sense of Derrida, that is a, let's say, different time of its desire, capable of producing a psychical, of producing a psychical individuation, which could also be a collective individuation capable of pursing modernization's obstructed horizon and as its future. These questions singularly lack in the analysis of the condition of trust so brilliantly conceptualized by Giddens. Undesirable modernization cannot last because it produces a disadjustment which is now global and which produces colossal internal contradictions that no sublimation power will be able to resolve. Yet only sublimation can transform the powers of this inhibition unleashed by the modernization process into desire, which is to say in social motives. Only a reinvented desire for modernity could cope and as a, a modernization of desire itself <coughs> with the intrin intrinsic contradictions of a modernization without modernity. Desire, and I will finish with this, was the fruit of a history of desire, such as it knows how to invent libidinal economies as sublimation and transgression systems, where psychical individuations built up in a collective individuation and uh, were what Gilbert Simonon calls a trans-individual, that is a signification forms. I couldn't finish, but it's not so important. Thank you very much.
I think is a sort of, a, it's actually a very romantic way in which, let's say, cultural discourses <coughs> have tended to approach the notion of, you know, what to do about the, the, the sort of the pretensions of objectivity, right, the, the sort of, of, of performances, and, and of course the enormous power that accompanies notions of objectivity within, let's say, the politics of knowledge the politics of the funding of knowledge, the claims that knowledge has on what a friend of mine calls the greater reality. Um, so, the, the sort of, so I was sort of thinking about this, and I was thinking <coughs> that in a way, I, I would need, from, from my perspective, I would need a very different <coughs> entry point. And um, the, the last year's um, wreath lectures, which are the lectures, that, it's a kind of, of lecture series that celebrates the, the founding of the BBC in 1926 by, by, um, uh, by John Rees, of course. Um, last year's wreath lectures were given by uh, Martin Rees, who is the president of the Royal Society of Astronomy. And he started his lectures by recalling a moment in 1666, right? The middle of the 17th century. You were there with your presentation, so in the middle of the 17th century. And, um, and this was the moment in which 10 men gathered um, in London in order to found the Royal Society. And they founded the Royal Society with the, the sort of, with, and, and, and they did this 
as, as a kind of slightly uh, um, marginal activity be before listening to an astronomy lecture by, um, what's the name of the famous architect who built St. Paul's, I keep forgetting. Christopher Wren. Wren. No, not Wren. Anyway, maybe the first one here. Um, uh, so the, the, and they were saying, we want to find a, a, a society that is dedicated to two things. One is to not taking anything on authority, right? So this is the, the kind of enlightenment move against the, the, the legacies of, of, of knowledge um, sort of packaged by, by absolutism, whatever that absolutism is. And the other is to a notion of experimental philosophy. And these are the two principles that guide the founding <coughs> of the, the um, Royal Society. And I, I'm sort of, of thinking that, in a way, because the, there, there is a kind of constant problem between trying to get <coughs> either objectivity or subjectivity, either the metaphysical or the scientific, to in some way be the potent critical tool that, of what you called unmasking of a, of a kind of deconstruction of the other. So that we're operating in a kind of epistemological field in which there has to be a deconstruct, the one has to deconstruct the other all the time, right? Because these are the kind of two poles around which knowledge in, in, a, in a kind of contentious way circulates. I was thinking that coming from a field in which there is the, the sort of another set of approaches to knowledge, I find entering your discussions, and I and I, I think they're not so. In some moments, I thought you were sort of sort of suggesting this, but you use a very different language than I do, um, and, and so I'm, I'm not sure that I always recognize things that are, are kind of more familiar to me. And that is the notion of treason. Uh, now, uh, this, this is obviously treason. of treason, of treason. So uh, I think it, it, it's obviously a notion that Deleuze brings up. Um, um, but the, the, the sort of, of, to enter the field of knowledge through a commitment to a notion of treason in which one enacts a betrayal of a set of fundamental kind of, of, of epistems, right? Of, of fundamental of, of, of foundations that say that um, th this is the way that, that this is what we have possible to us. These assumptions are what we have possible for us in order to know. So the, the, um, I'm, I'm very interested in the notion of treason and it's in its enactment as a series of betrayals, I think very much in the spirit of the mid-17th century notion of taking nothing on authority. And um, we now have the Mandarin translation of treason, except <laughs> um, in, in, in the sense that um, it, it seems to me that where, where we need to come in, where certain kinds of cultural practices have a seat at the table in all of this, is in, their posi in, in, in the way in which they um, sort of demand a completely different situation or positionality of from where to know. And it's, <coughs> and it's a position, positionality or a self-situating that isn't within the grand trajectories of accumulated knowledge, but in a kind of performative and active relation to these, right? So that you don't slot yourself within this tradition or that tradition, but you enact the tensions between those traditions in a completely different way. And, and, and you use the notion of treason, of, of sort of the very act, by which you turn your back. Now, treason, both in the way in which Deleuze puts it forward and in the way in which, you know, I, I want to think about it, 
is not the 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 sort of, of how am I going to say this? It's not the the purposeful destruction um, or or maiming. It's not the purposeful maiming of an existing project, right? So treason is not operating as um, a kind of underhanded maiming of a particular project. Treason is operating, I think, and, that, and that's where I think it's very fitting for what, what um, for knowledge as it comes from, from kind of contemporary artistic practices. Treason is operating as a, a sort of an absolute unwillingness for capture to take place. Right? So these are two Deleuzean terms. Both treason and capture are, 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 are two Deleuzean terms that I think are, are extremely important. So how, how do you enact the complete unwillingness to be captivated without opposing, <coughs> right? Because the, 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 sort of, the, 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 the problem for me to enter these discussions is a problem not of the terms that they set up, but of the relations between those terms. And the relations those, between those terms have to be ones of opposition, or unmasking, or impossibility. And I think that the, the sort of, of the moment in which we produce an unwillingness to be captured by a series of, <coughs> of models of how to know, and we perform that not as an opposition and not as a negation, but as the, the sort of, 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 you spoke about the notion of a third way, uh, the, the sort of, of, of the notion of a, a coming into being through, not, not an argument with something, but through the, the sort of, of dismantling of its captivity is what the, the sort of, of, I think, cultural, kind of, of contemporary cultural practices have to add to all of, to all of this. And um, the, the, the sort of, and, and I, have, I have a whole series of questions, that I think, to, to both of you, because you are, in, in a way, much, your cartographer is on a much grander scale than I am. Um, the, I, I have a series of questions about how, how, what we might do with, for example, with taxonomy in relation to that, because in, in a way that also dismantles the notion of, you know, of taxonomy, of aggregation, of accumulation, because when you enact betrayal, when you're operating in the mode of treason, what you're doing is you're not you're not making a selection of the bits inside the paradigm, right? You're not saying I'll have this, but I don't want this, this, and this. Right? This is not useful, um, and so on. What you're saying, the walls of the paradigm. It's Jericho, right? It's the moment of Jericho. Uh, Joshua and Jericho are the moment of of, of treason. The, the you sound the horn, the walls fall down. And then the, the sort of taxonomy of what's inside them is not where you engage. It's not that it's not important. It's not where you engage. So I suppose I'm coming at both of your presentations with a sort of a, a series of questions about the location of engagement and how that location of engagement can operate when it's not negating, opposing, operating in binaries, <coughs> having to choose, or, I think in Bernard's terms, setting one bit to unmask the other bit. Which I agree with you, is an incredibly um, sort of, of, of um, seductive notion. I think to set one bit to unmask the other bit, but <laughs> um, it, still, you know, it, it still leaves us within a sort of set. So I suppose uh, this is the best I can do to a series of, of presentations that I just encountered at this moment. But it does, it does leave me with a whole set of questions about positionality. And what I think for us is so important, where do we engage from, right? The, 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 
I, I think that you know that that, that old Foucauldian notion um, that is somehow has not lost its power for me, which is the moment in which you make a problematic your own, and which I, I still find utterly captivating. So I, I suppose those are, are kind of my questions. And now I I don't know if Michael's got questions. And I don't want to superimpose my questions on anybody else's questions. Mm -hmm. So I can do this privately <clears throat> over drink later? Yeah, or probably it's a, it's a good idea now to have three or four questions <clears throat> from everybody. Yeah. And and then um, and then Wang Wei and uh, and Bernard come back to the to answer after after we get three or four more questions. Okay. That was that was a really a, a, a much better way I think to respond <laughs> than a direct response. It was fascinating to put new stuff on the table as well. Uh, Michael. Um, mine's actually more of a comment and probably more of a response than the questions that you put, if that's all right. I just want to start off, Bernard, with your comment about being against modernity is being against the market. And I, want, I want to sort of peel that back to the point where you were talking about modernity with, without modernization, which I think is fascinating. Leading to things like nationalism and fundamentalism, which are in a sense part of modernity, but, uh, uh, but essentially coming to a position where the market rules, and, and where we are at the minute is where the market rules. Um, the reason I want to raise that is because it seems to me, I, I kind of do want, I, in a sense, more like a, more like a respondent than a question, really. I wanted to link that to what Wang Wei was talking about in science. And the way I would link it is by kind of a lacuna, I guess, in, 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 in your talk. Not, not, not a problem, but a lacuna. Namely, the former existence of a planned economy. Now, the reason I bring that up is because it seems to me that the former existence of a non a planned economy actually links us back to China in a way that is, is quite precise, actually. But first of all, before I get there, it just, just to kind of rehearse a history that we're already familiar with, if, 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 if we actually shift the focus from, in, China, which in Chinese it's called Kezhue, if we shift the focus from Kezhue to Xueke, to the disciplines, and actually move to the discipline of economics and ask that question about how has it come to pass that, as Foucault says in his lectures, that, 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 that the notion of veridiction lies now with the market. How has that, how's that moment come to be? How have we reached that point? And, and, in, and in a sense, it seems to me, if one traces back to the kind of post-war years, you can literally trace through the discipline and also through the political in, in a different realm, a kind of a trajectory which leads us to that point. The disciplinary shift, it seems to me, is out of Keynesianism and Neo-Keynesianism <coughs> into Friedman Friedmanism, which correlates at exactly the same time, and indeed is produced by Reagan and Thatcher uh, as a kind of a political tool to bring down the war and bring down an alternative form of imagining modernity, which is namely the planned economy. Planned economy, of course, gets me across the pitch to one way. And, 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 and to the kind of point we are now in, in China where, where that kind of idea of socialist planning, it seems to me, is, 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 is kind of given way to what's, I think, laughingly called a socialist, uh, uh, socialist market economy. And I say laughingly called because if we think in terms of science rather than just the discipline of economics, when we think of that broader way in which science frames the way we live in this world and the way we think through this world, we start to look at kind of really kind of micro level kind of concerns that go on within the disciplines in China. And, and, and if I think back to the 80s, when, when economic reform first started, there was no interest in critical economics or political economy, there was interest in the science of economics. And there was a huge debate in China in the early 80s around whether there was this thing called a laws, uh, uh, economic laws. And, and, and it was proven there were. Now once you've proven there were, you've actually taken a major political step. We reach a point where, in a sense, the whole of the process within China gets implicated within that particular logic. And if you think about, for instance, I mean, I would raise things like, why is it that when we think about our own positions within the universities and we think about these god-awful things like research assessment exercises and all of these ways of assessing and checking and double-checking, yes. essentially, where did that begin on the international stage? Now, it certainly was here. But actually the first place that developed a system to actually rank universities, which is actually a way of producing a narrowing of knowledge because everybody wants to be number one and it follows a very, very vertical rather than a kind of a more horizontal and broader reach, it starts in Jiaotong University in Shanghai. 
It's not in Jungle University. <laughs> that belief in science, then, in, in, in China, it seems to me, holds these various disparate elements together. And it's the, the holding of those elements together via science, it seems to me, is something that I think Wang Hui's work pinpoints. And it pinpoints it not in the kind of just the, the economic reform period, but right back to that kind of critical iconoclastic moment, the mid 40s yeah. And all of the figures that you talk about, uh, whether it's uh, Liang Qichao or, 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 well, any of them. I mean, basically, we have, a, we have a belief there, not just in science, but in the modern, in modernity, mm -hmm. in a kind of, it's much more totalizing than simply the discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think you start to run up against that when you hit the moment of, of Maltodon, which comes out of the very different, which comes out of that strongly Marxist science, but spends 40 years in the desert, essentially, in the rural areas, in a telluric existence, which they then have to kind of try and modify. And if I, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of going off, oh, maybe I'll just, okay, I'll just finish, I'll try and finish. Don't finish. <laughs> okay, the, 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 if, you think, if you look at the disciplines within, within China, and you look at what happens, I'm sorry, this is kind of related to work I'm doing at the minute around acupuncture. And, and, around, <laughs> and, and, if, and the interesting thing about, traditional Chinese medicine is how Maoism tries to scientize it. It tries to scientize it by a systematization, but it can't get rid of the T. It can't get rid of the, of the, of the, of the, the acupunctural points are all determined by a cosmology that lies outside of the reach of science. And it seems to me it's at that moment when, when Ma Maoism's actually trying to discipline it into a science that we, we, we encounter this breach. Not, not because Maoism's doing anything, but because Maoism can't do anything to deal with this question of the floor. It tries to limit it to the body, it tries to limit it, its, its effect in, in, in a kind of cosmological sense, but still it's there, and its presence remains. And it seems to me this becomes a kind of crucial moment that I think, for me anyway, one needs to pull out of it more broadly. A couple more questions. Of course, there's nothing to say, but... <coughs> Uh, Bella, you talked about the question what is globally desirable, and you talked also about the history of desire. So maybe we should or we could ask, when did this uh, the, the global dimension become desirable? This would require a whole genealogy. Uh, and to, to, to keep it short, the point is that but the global has been always imposed. It has never reached through a due process. So, wouldn't it be more productive to put together the global and the local also in our questions and to ask instead what's globally desirable, what's locally desirable? Um, okay, the point I wanted to make was <clears throat> maybe to, to, to bring both these together. Um, I thought the, I mean, the three interventions after have been. Really, really super positive. Um, <clears throat> was um, for the first time I've understood uh, Bernard's theory of desire. Um, <laughs> what, 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 well, he was about six years old. <laughs> <in the day. laughs> <laughs> what did you do? And I think it relates. Your theory of desire is not a million miles away from what Michael was talking about in terms of cheap and energy. Because this kind of energy, and maybe it's also an energy of pleasing, among other things. It, 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 it's, it's an energy, well, the important thing is that desire is not dry. As you know. and, 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 and this kind of desire is, is an energizer of many things. And it's also, it's also a mode of engaging with techne. It's not instrumental, not just as means. And when you mention Nietzsche and active nihilism there, it makes you think of Walter Benjamin. On modernity, because Benjamin's notion of modernity, which is one that effaces both the subject and the object, for a different kind of subjectivity, right, mm -hmm. and a different mode of urban life and art and all these kind of things, is very much based on Nietzsche and active nihilism. Mm -hmm. So that you can read a Freud reading in it, like like you have there. But my point, and, and I think, of course, you 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 also techno, technize it, which I think is fantastic, and make it into kind of you know a, a, not not just humans, but a human technical. Of desire and individuation, which is which is fantastic, but I but I don't think that, and I do think that a lot of this stuff is played out 
And I do think it's at the basis of modernity and some of modernization destroys it. But I don't think it's played out in China. I think China is where the energy is happening. It's where the tea is. There's a lot of shit happening in China. But there's a lot of energy there. There's a huge amount of energy there. And I think there's also an energy of globalization. It's not just an imposed thing. It's something that's driven by some kind of desire as well. And the motor ain't here anymore. It's somewhere else. You know, it's in Sao Paulo, it's in China, it's in, it's in maybe India, it's in Turkey in certain ways, but it's somewhere else. But just to finish, the, um, the thing that strikes me is that, um, <clears throat> is that it's not necessarily just a human you know, notion of chi or desire, but it's also not drive, it's something else. And, that, and, <clears throat> and, and I think that there is, I, I do think that we in the West are suffering from an incredible, what Havamash used to call a motivation crisis. You know, and that there has been an emptying out of all this. But, I, but, but having said that, I think that there's a, I mean, that's why I'm attracted to the East, I mean, to China. There's just a huge energy there. It's a corrupt, all sorts of energy, but the energy is there and it ain't here. And, 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 it, and it's in the same way. And it's, and it's something I think that in a weird way is not completely um, disconnected disconnected from the notion that the way that even some kind of technology and the whole way that engineering in a funny way, and the masses of engineers that are coming out in China that are driving not just the workers in Guangdong, but the engineers that are also driving the Chinese economy. So I'm, I'm much more, much less pessimistic and much more optimistic uh, about, about, about this sort of thing, but I think it relates to both of you. Kind of kind of like this. A couple more points, and then you guys have Mike is going to say something. I was just thinking Faust. <laughs> exactly. Faust. It is Faust. I just wanted to, um, there seems to be a sort of, a, just as a sort of an aura coming out of all of your talks, is this kind of like a will or a desire towards a sort of a treason or a decentering or a sort of like a liberation from authority or authorship? And I, I just wonder, um, or, or from, from opposition, I just wonder to what it, to, uh, at what point does, uh, does this kind of liberation become a sort of neoliberation, become a sort of a neoliberalism, um, which which you know undermine and recuperate exactly the challenge that we're trying to that we're trying to look for. How does that relate to to to, um, to, 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 to the destruction of? Desirability, which is which uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 if, uh, like Pascal said, uh, the desire or the qi, the energy in China that, that's uh, emerging, that's uh, the, uh, actually the desire to market and the global capital uh, flow. So how would uh, Bernard say about it? Uh, how to dis uh, disengage or to dis doubling this uh, desire that's uh, uh, so rapidly and maybe for, for Scott it's uh, optimistically uh, right enough. So, so it, it's actually a, a new desire for that uh, market identity, like a whole market of uh, desire. So uh, how, but it's also a little bit dinner. In some way. It is fattening. Yeah, so how, how, would, how could we? <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Along the same lines, can I just ask uh, Dr. Long to, to just lean out a bit? Because I think you, you ended your lecture with this is the way the educational system has been set up in China with you know the metaphysical and all the hard sciences, and then you get the humanities. And I'm asking you to lean out a bit as to, given all that you've said, and given all that the questions here, so what's the, what's the geopolitics for China? <coughs> what's, what's, what's really going to happen when people are educated that way? And, and you didn't say anything about the kind of the, the impressions of one over the other. But I'm sure there are underlying, you know, how parents in China don't want children to do certain kinds of uh, majors or topics, right? So, so if, if you would comment on that, so what is that? 
And what's going to happen with China then? One last point, maybe, before we go back. Um, I think I got really interested when the uh, presentation got to the point when we were kind of talking about experiencing contemporary China as um, modernization without modernity. And I find it really fascinating. Um, also, because I find it strange that at this point we are kind of still trying to understand our, our experience with contemporary China or this concept of China <laughs> using such overloaded terms um, from the West or disciplines from the West, the Western you know, understanding of uh, humanities or philosophy or moments in history. <laughs> I find it um, rather patronizing, <coughs> to be quite honest. And um, in a sense that could we talk about a society or a different mode of living um, or allow it to be subsumed in this kind of terminology that's still constantly referring back to moments in history uh, of a European kind of geography. And then going back to the, the other comment we were talking about, and I, um, I can't help but when you know, the, the, the comments started talking about Chinese um, medicine and the tea and et cetera, et cetera. And also, especially, then we started talking about the focus, uh, like contemporary China manifesting this phenomenon of having a specific focus on the scientific, or rather a genoflexion or kowtow or whatever to the kind of scientific, and that as a thread, as you will, that goes through all these contemporary Chinese moments. And I find that fascinating too, because as I said, so often in the West, when I listen to lectures about China, when people talk about chi contemporary China, or whatever that concept actually means, I just, so often I feel like, why are we talking about it as if it is, um, why are we talking about it as if it's, running in the discourse of European, fair, uh, European history still. And um, are we not understanding it through its own discourses, which I think what's useful with the presentation here I see is that we're kind of starting to think about the rights of humanities. We're starting to think about the so-called diversity of spirit, which kind of abstractly <coughs> implies all the kind of ch other Chinese disciplines. Chinese medicine, Taoism, philosophy, that cannot be subsumed under all this epistemology, uh, 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 Western epistemology, which is what interests me. But um, yes, but then obviously we were also talking about the problem of positionality of the artist, of the researcher altogether, even before we choose to enter into such a discourse where we want to discuss about China or contemporary China or rather or whether or not we're actually talking about ourselves in the sense of a European self, obviously. Um, or that, you know, s such a kind of discourse is actually talking about Europe, after all. Are we really, uh, how much are we talking about China? The words like tea comes off like a, you know, like a fantastical term, but do we actually talk about it on a deeper level than just merely bringing it up to contrast with this fantastical other phenomenon of science. No, we're not. So I do think that this whole kind of concept of a discourse into contemporary China is regressive. And in fact, it's, it could do more damage than good in my, if we're not taking care of the way in which we enter into it. This is my opinion. Um, should we maybe go back to one way first and then and then dinner? Me? Okay. Yeah, you. <laughs> I end. It's uh, uh, the, my talk is uh, ended in the middle. I talk about, but, but these are the given condition. It's uh, well, let's talk about the taxonomy and link to your question. Uh, because. We talk about this, we need to know that uh, where is our so-called reality. You studied here, or you studied in China, that you are, that the reality is your 
life shaped by this kind of the trend. So that's why the people know maybe the qi or some other different kind of Chinese medicine, but eventually that kind of knowledge eventually will be organized into this kind of new taxonomy. So that's why the, the, uh, we, we talk about the, the uh, knowledge and the power and we talk about this uh, discipline and so on and so forth. This, so this is inevitable. However, is there any alternative, let's say, or the third way or something like that? Uh, give you some example. Uh, some example is interesting. Uh, I used to, I measured these examples for many times. That's about the Chinese medicine. In, in 2003, uh, you know that in China we had a SARS, very serious SARS. And the whole country was mobilized against that SARS. However, how to deal with SARS? That the, the, uh, we had the system, the hospital system, you know. Because this is very special. It's, it's easily to be spread over to other people. So according to the law, only those hospitals who were, we, I don't know how, the Chinese being, it's very special. Indeed. Yes, right. Only those hospitals can receive the patient, those people. However, at that time, no way to deal with it because the, the medicine, the West, so-called the Western medicine, medicine don't know what's, what's the reason of the SARS. Uh, at that time, the, uh, the Chinese medicine was prevented to receive the patients from, for, uh, you know, because they have no way to set up, um, the, the, the isolate the, the patient. So that's why the, the, we had the discussion at that time. I always, I always found it the, uh, so interesting because uh, there was a very famous Chinese doctor uh, whose name is uh, Lu Guangzhen, 80 years old at that time, old than that. He told us we had a debate between the scientist and the Chinese doctor. Together with the, one side, it's a, the scientist, another is the Chinese doctor. Basically, uh, the, the scientist was very sympathetic to Chinese medicine. He talked about the qi, the jing luo, and so on and so forth, but he criticized that the Chinese medicine has no experimental results about the way to prove the very existence of the Jing Luo and so on and so forth. But basically that started from the uh, taxonomy, which means the Chinese medicine as a discipline of medicine. You, know, mm -hmm. you need to do that. And, uh, and uh, Lu Guangzhen, Dr. Lu Guangzhen uh, made the response to that. It's quite interesting. He said that the, well, the Chinese medicine maybe is not the medicine at all. In, in Chinese case, it's, uh, he said that the, uh, it's not the, the uh, yi xue, but the yang shen xue. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of another yeah. way. <laughs> because for Chinese medicine, they needed to know the reason of the disease to deal with it. Because the, uh, the Western science, you always need to find the reason. Then you find the medicine to deal with it. However, Chinese medicine, they didn't to know that there was a reason for this. The only way is to know that the, which part of in your body was healthy. And eventually try to isolate the part of bad. No reason, we don't know what's reason, but you know it's bad. So help the certain kind of the cell butter within your body to overcome that the disease, the enemy. So that's why he said that the uh, very simple political metaphor. He said that the the, uh, the, uh, the maybe the Western medicine basically is a way to find an enemy in your body. So that's it. And uh, and the Chinese medicine try to find the friends in your body to overcome the enemy. But though you don't know where is the, the, the enemy, who is the enemy, but not not important. Because you have a lot of the friends. <laughs> so, that, uh, uh, so that's he said that he then he referred to Mao's citation from Mao's 
right? You know, who is the uh, our enemy? Who is our friend? This is the fundamental question for Chinese revolution. <laughs> and, uh, is it is also the fundamental question for Chinese medicine and the body. So it's not a simple joke, I think, because these kind of the comparison, certain kind of the wisdom. That's what the, the Wallerstein talk about. That the why sometimes we need the wisdom, not the knowledge. So you, you need a certain kind of the wisdom, not the knowledge, to go back to find something even more robotic <laughs> in that sense. But, 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 but sometimes now, especially now, uh, I think this is the, the, that's why we think about this. But the wisdom, the wisdom, the starting point of the wisdom is really need to know the, uh, the circumstances of time. Because without that, the circumstances of time. Of time. Of time. Circumstances of time. That's in Chinese term is a or propensity of time or the force because the the, the, the situation. It's, yeah, right. The, the Chinese term is no, no, but without the knowledge of the circumstances of time. Circumstances of time, which, which means that the, because the, that the circumstance of time is not the object, mm -hmm. because you are the part of the construction, oh. of the, constructing that the, 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 uh, that the situation. So in that sense, you, you understand the circumstances, it means that the, you need to know where is your reality, mm -hmm. and then find that. So in that sense, it's a, not to get rid of the knowledge, but find the more wisdom from there. Yeah. So. You should see there. <laughs> there were a lot of very interesting questions and discussions. And thank you very much for all those questions in your lecture. Uh, I just want to from the beginning to answer your what you said about Roman history. Mm -hmm. Mystagogy, what I call mystagogy, is not at all romantic. It is, in fact, <coughs> precisely what is at, at stake for me in the question of desire. And when I say desire, I, I, I designate, uh, let's say, scientific concept for this, by psychoanalysis. It is a rational concept, exposed to critique, contradiction, etc., etc., for which I believe that we need an organology. I, I believe that uh, at the moment we enjoy Lacan, but maybe not with Winnicott, we still need an organology that is a uh, situation of techniques, artifacts in the theory of design. I, I believe it is, it is extremely important even with Deleuze and Guattari, because themselves never explore this question with what they call the machine des irons. They are not at all machines, because they come from the very formal theory of machine, of dream, and uh, this discussion mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. abstract machine. Mm -hmm. So it's not at all a technical object. No. I believe we must go back to the material is extremely important. And I say that because what you call trism and referring to, to Deleuze is for me the question of pharmacology in the sense of my use of Plato. Uh, if you think things as pharmaca, not as objects, uh, you can't uh, think with opposition, for example. You can't say, think a subject in front of an object. It doesn't work like that because in this type of uh, consideration or theorization, uh, there is no not a subject, there is, there is not uh, an object. There is a process of co-individuation of the psychical, the collective, and the technical. So it's it's a milieu, and it is. A milieu of relations, and I think with the Chinese culture, it is extreme, extremely interesting and important, as you say <laughs> to me, to, to uh, 
to have the question, uh, a discussion, an international discussion between the West and China around the question, what is a relation? This is extremely important. And a relation which is not an opposition, but a, what I call a composition. But this composition, what, for which I, I risk the expression third way, and I don't say a third way, I'm not at all in the sense of Blair. Blair. I'm, I'm not at all. <laughs> no. It is another way uh, between idealism and materialism, or mm -hmm. uh, transcendentalism and empiricism, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. And there is another way, which is, for me, passing through the pharmacon and organology <coughs> techniques. <laughs> you said, um, you talk about uh, taxonomy of taxonomy. This question of taxonomy is extremely important today. I defend this, this uh, point of view because we are today with this machine processing machines for automated categorization Absolutely. produced by networked computers. And this is an industry of categorization. So if there is a question of uh, the new geolo geopolitics for China, what is geopolitics for China? It is a new geopolitics of categorization with an ideogrammatic culture, which is not coming from alphabet because I believe that categorization in China is not at all the same than in the West. Because there was one question extremely important for me, but we didn't speak about it. It is writing, the role and the status of writing in the West and in China. And today, uh, with the computer, is there is a new articulation between alphabetic writing and ideogrammatic writing. Hmm. Personally, I believe that the question of education in China is to protect the ideogrammatic culture. This is the treasure of China. And if you can protect this, you will become the most important of China uh, for the 21st century. <laughs> because uh, I, I, I'm not necessarily against an empire. <laughs> if it is producing really good things. <laughs> but I think now it is the decadence of America and Europe. And you must re-articulate these questions with your culture, which is the culture of relation, of techniques, pragmatism, and ideology. And this is extremely important for you to think this in your culture, not with the Californian one, which is completely exhausted. So, uh, I go in California next week for explaining <laughs> to my friend, <laughs> Berkeley, that it is Le Chant du Singh. That is, uh, you know, in French, Le Chant du Singh, it is, you are extremely strong at the end, but it is the end. And they are at the end. And we are, we are at the end. So, about the question of plan economy, etc., the question of economy, here, the question of economy is a question of economy of techniques and the, and the status of, uh, of economy in the economics, in which we need to reconstruct what I call a, a new political economy. That is, economy is not at all a milieu. <laughs> economy is a, a, di a dimension of relationship. And in this, we must overcome the opposition, the couple of use value and exchange value. It doesn't work. We can't continue to think economy with these concepts. It does. That doesn't work. We must think what I call practice value. And this is what is at stake in, in Chinese medicine. Chinese is a practical value. Not a practical, it's a practice value. And um, here I, I think that the question of economy is a democratic economy. What is a democratic economy? And there is not an opposition between society on the one side and the economy on the other side. There is a, an illusion of opposition with the liberal economy that you are the, the, the sphere of the economy and the, the rest. No, no, it's not at all the case. So we have to rethink an economy of knowledge. But I will stop because it's well, fine. Well, yeah. well, yeah. well, <laughs> that I, I, I wanted to, uh, to answer your question about mm. global and local. One. We will speak about that. We talk about the pub. In the pub, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you to all the people who are along the way.
and in the techniques. <laughs> <laughs>